The Cigar Girl, The Death of Mary Rogers, 1841. The Mysterious Murder of Mary Rogers, known in the Penny Press as the Beautiful Cigar Girl, in the summer of 1841 remains one of New York City's most infamous unsolved cases. Even Edgar Allan Poe took a crack at solving it, yet while her ghost is said to have visited the numerous suspects that the press circled after the beautiful young lady's death, the truth of the grisly crime is still as murky as the Hudson River waters where her corpse was found. The death of Mary Rogers marked the rise of tabloids, known in the 1840s as the Penny Press. The media covered almost every clue that emerged and possible suspects believed to be linked to Rogers. They used her murder to sell newspapers to a growing readership of people from the working class. Disappearance of Mary Rogers It was a hot and humid day in New York City and 93 degrees in the shade. Mary Cecilia Rogers prepared to go out on Sunday, July 25, 1841. She put on a white dress, black shawl, blue scarf, light-colored shoes, and a leghorn hat and grabbed a parasol to protect herself from the rays of the midsummer sun. She lived at the boarding house she ran with her mother, Phoebe, at 126, Nassau Street in the heart of the city. The three-story, red-brick boarding house on Nassau Street was at the center of the city's newspaper, printing, and publishing industries and located close to City Hall, the port area, and Wall Street. Once she was ready to leave for the day, Rogers knocked on Payne's bedroom door. The cork cutter had come to board in the fall of 1840. He became involved with Rogers soon afterward, and the couple was engaged. Payne was in the midst of shaving when she told him that she was off to visit her aunt, Mrs. Downing, and would return in the evening. As Payne said goodbye, he told his fiancée that he would wait for her at the stagecoach stop on the corner of Broadway and in streets at 7 p.m., as he often did when she came home late. It was quiet, as it usually was on Sundays, when Rogers stepped outside at 10 a.m. Shops and taverns were closed until late afternoon, and the streets were empty except for a few churchgoers and those out for an early walk. About an hour later Payne went to visit his brother, John Payne, and then he headed downtown to join the crowds that gathered on Broadway in the early evening. A storm blew in as he was walking towards and street to meet Rogers at 7 p.m. Believing that she would most likely wait out the thunderstorm at her aunt's house for the night, Payne returned to the boarding house alone and went to sleep. It didn't seem unusual to anyone at the boarding house when Rogers did not return home first thing the next morning, but by lunchtime that Monday her continuing absence began to worry her mother and Payne. He went to see Mrs. Downing and discovered that Rogers had never arrived at her aunt's house. He continued to search for his fiancée, but neither friends nor relatives had seen her. He searched from Harlem to Brooklyn, Hoboken to Staten Island, but he found no sign of her. Payne walked into the offices of the New York Sun and placed a missing person notice to run in Tuesday's edition of the paper. It was not the first time that 21-year-old Rogers had disappeared. John Anderson hired the pretty young woman in 1838 to stand behind the counter at his tobacco shop on nearby Broadway, hoping her presence at Anderson's Tobacco Emporium would attract male customers. Gold lettering above the door listed the items for sale inside including cedars, fine cut, and confections. Rogers became known as the Beautiful Cigar Girl, and the shop became a popular hangout for authors, editors, and newspaper reporters. One day in October 1838 Rogers failed to show up for work. She reappeared two weeks later, saying that she had been resting with friends in Brooklyn because she felt tired. She was surprised by the amount of interest that her disappearance had generated. A rumor began circulating that Rogers had been seen in the company of a tall and handsome naval officer during her absence. She never returned to work for Anderson. Search for Mary Rogers Two days after Rogers disappeared on July 25, 1841, Payne continued to search for his fiancée. He heard that a young woman matching Rogers' description had been seen at a pub for several hours on the day that she disappeared. He spoke to the keeper of the pub but was no closer to finding her. After finding no trace of her during a second trip to Hoboken, he returned to the city in early afternoon. Payne went to the shop where he worked as a cork cutter and went home at 7 p.m. The next morning Cromelin joined the search. He had lived at the Rogers boarding house from December 7, 1840, until June 1841. 
he moved out after Rogers rejected him in favor of his fellow border pain. Just before she disappeared, Rogers left a rose in the keyhole of Cromwellan's office door. Although he found out on Monday that Rogers hadn't returned home, he didn't start looking for her until he saw the newspaper advertisement about her disappearance on Wednesday. He spoke to Phoebe to confirm her daughter's disappearance. Cromwellan then joined the search with his friend Padley, who had also once roomed at the Rogers boarding house. They took one of the steamboats that frequently crossed the Hudson River from New York City to Hoboken. After disembarking near a hotel and tavern, it was a short walk to the Elysian Fields, a scenic spot of about four or five acres that was surrounded on three sides by trees and looked towards the river on the fourth side. In the 1840s it was a popular spot for city dwellers to get away to the country. It was also home to a popular refreshment house known as Nick Moore's House. On that hot afternoon of July 28, 1841, James Boulard and Henry Mallon were walking along the shore near a part of Hoboken known as Sybil's Cave. As they looked out across the Hudson River, one of the men spotted a body floating in the water about 200 or 300 yards from where they were standing. Boulard and Mallon raced to the Elysian Fields dock, jumped into a boat, and rowed quickly towards it. As they got closer, they realized it was the fully dressed body of a young woman. They tried several times unsuccessfully to fish the body out of the river, and finally they tied a rope around the dead woman and dragged her back to shore behind the boat. At the same time, John Bertram, William Waller, and a man named Luther spotted what they initially thought were clothes as they cruised by in their sailboat. By the time Boulard and Mallon had reached the shore with their cargo, a crowd had gathered. The men laid the woman's body down on the beach. As people pressed forward to gawk, Cromelin, who had joined the growing crowd, leaned forward and realized he was staring at the body of Mary Rogers. She was still wearing the same clothes that she had put on three days earlier, a flowered bonnet, blue dress, petticoat, pantalettes, stockings, and garters. But her face was badly beaten. She had strips of lace from her petticoat tied around her neck in a sailor's knot, and her body was bruised and waterlogged. Rogers's body was transported from the beach to the village of Hoboken, where County Coroner Dr. Richard F. Cook performed an autopsy. He concluded she has been gagged, strangled, and raped, perhaps repeatedly, before being thrown into the Hudson River. He also said that her face was swollen and was a mark about the size and shape of a man's thumb on the right side of her neck and two or three marks on the left side that resembled the shape of a man's fingers. Marks appeared to indicate that her wrists had been tied together and her dress was torn. Blood was still dripping from her mouth. There were no signs that Rogers was pregnant. Cromelin identified the body and stayed with it until the coroner had completed his investigation. By then it was nearly 9 p.m. and the ferries had stopped operating for the day. Cromelin stayed at the Jersey City Hotel and returned to New York City in the morning, bringing news of Rogers's death and some pieces of her clothing, including flowers from her hat, a garter, the bottom of her pantalette, and a curl of her hair. Phoebe Rogers confirmed they belonged to her daughter. A grieving Phoebe closed up her boarding house and moved in with her sister. Frenzy of Media Coverage it was so hot that Rogers's body was quickly buried in Hoboken, New Jersey. Within hours of being found to prevent it from decomposing further. But her story did not die after her burial. Instead, it grew when New York City newspapers began covering the murder on August 1, 1841, for days after her body was found and a week after she had vanished. It was more than the lurid details of her death that captivated reporters and editors. Rogers, who was known as the beautiful cigar girl, had waited on many of them when she worked at Anderson's Tobacco Emporium. Newly emerging tabloid newspapers, known as the Penny Press went into a frenzy with their coverage of the unsolved murder. More respectable newspapers followed. The case changed the way in which the press covered homicides, and they began reporting virtually every clue and possible suspect in the case, which helped to sell newspapers. For example, the Herald published the lengthy details of the coroner's report on August 17, 1841. Newspapers also floated theories about the circumstances surrounding Rogers's death. They speculated that she had been brutally raped and killed by one of the urban gangs that roamed the streets of New York City, that she had been killed by one of her beaus, 
that her death was a suicide, and even that she had not died but merely disappeared and that the body that was found belonged to some other unfortunate young woman. The coverage sparked competition among the media outlets and generated public interest in the story. Members of the public went to Sybil's cave to see where Rogers's body had been found. The newspapers also called for more involvement by police and other government officials in what they felt was a dragging official investigation. Herald editor James Gordon Bennett set up a citizens' committee to complain about what his group felt was a slow response to the murder by the police and government officials and to offer a reward for information leading to arrests in the case. New York Governor William Seward subsequently added to the reward money. Police Investigation The investigation dragged and advanced little while the NJ and New York sides wrangled. Newspapers pointed out that regardless of where Mary Rogers had been killed, she was a New York resident. City officials finally bowed to public pressure and took on the case. At the request of New York City's acting mayor, Rogers's body was exhumed from her grave in Hoboken on Wednesday, August 11, 1841, and brought to the dead house at City Hall Park in New York City. Although the New Jersey coroner had determined that the cause of death was strangulation, the New York City coroner registered the cause of death as a drowning. Rogers was finally buried without ceremony at the cemetery of the West Presbyterian Church. The New York City police investigation into the murder finally went into full swing. They received information that Rogers was seen in the company of an unidentified man in the hours before her disappearance. In an effort to find him, police questioned several men, including Payne, former boarders Cromelin and Kaycock, as well as Joseph Morse and her former employer John Anderson. Newspapers almost immediately cast suspicion on Rogers's fiancé Daniel Payne. He quickly went to the offices of the New York Times and Evening Star to show sworn affidavits from witnesses attesting to his whereabouts on the day Rogers disappeared. Police noted that the lace around the victim's neck had been tied in a seaman's knot, and suspicion fell on sailor and former boarder William Kaycock. At the time, the law allowed police to hold suspects for days without being charged. Arresting people first and then finding evidence against them afterwards was not unusual. Police arrested Kaycock on suspicion of being involved in Rogers's death, but witnesses provided a credible alibi for his whereabouts between the Sunday that Rogers disappeared and the Tuesday when he boarded the USS North Carolina in the harbor. Then police turned their attention to an engraver Joseph Morse, who worked on Nassau Street and had apparently been seen with Mary Rogers the same evening that she disappeared. The morning after she vanished, Morse had a violent fight with his wife and fled town. Police tracked him down and found him living under an assumed name in Boylston, Massachusetts. They arrested him and brought him back to New York by steamboat for questioning. He said that he had, indeed, spent the night with a woman named Mary. He was released a few days later, after a woman named Mary Haviland came forward and said that she was the woman he had been with on Staten Island the day that Mary Rogers disappeared. In fact, he tried unsuccessfully to seduce her in a hotel room, she recounted. John Anderson, Rogers's former employer, was also questioned. Having run out of leads, the police investigation stalled. New Clues Unearthed At the end of August, two boys found a small opening in a thicket that led into a cramped cave not far from where Rogers's body was found. On four stones were draped a silk scarf, white petticoat, parasol, and a mildewed linen handkerchief with the initials M.R. The boys picked up the items and brought them to their mother, Frederica Loss, who was the innkeeper of Nick Moore's house near the Elysian Fields. She turned over the clothing to police. Then a stagecoach driver came forward and said that he thought he had seen Rogers arrive on the Hoboken Ferry with a well-dressed man who had a dark complexion. He said they had gone to a tavern kept by Mrs. Loss. When questioned by police, Loss said she remembered them coming in for a drink and then leaving and wandering off into woods. She said she later heard a scream but didn't pay attention to it because Sundays often bring people with rowdy behavior. The discovery of the clothes increased interest in the case for a few weeks. On October 8, 1841, Daniel Payne left New York City and wandered around the Hoboken area in a drunken state. Two New Yorkers were out walking when they found him lying on the ground near the thicket where his fiancée E.S. clothes had been found. 
he was drunk and had an empty bottle of laudanum beside him. He lost consciousness quickly and died. A note in his pocket read, To the world, here I am on the spot, God forgive me for my misfortune and my misspent time. He had committed suicide. His friends and his brother John said he had been devastated by Rogers's death and drank heavily. Alleged Confession Interest in the case waned again until the fall of 1842. Innkeeper Frederica Loss was accidentally shot by one of her three sons while he was handling a loaded gun. As she lay dying, she called Justice Gilbert Merritt of New Jersey to her bedside. He had questioned her previously because he believed that she provided abortions or allowed her in to be used by doctors for that purpose. He suspected that Rogers had died there during a botched abortion and that Loss's sons had disposed of the body. Loss told Merritt that Rogers came to her house on Sunday, July 25, 1841, with a young doctor who performed an abortion. Rogers died of complications while under the physician's care, and Loss's sons dropped the body into the river at night where it would be found. Her clothes were scattered in the woods, where they were later located. The confession was questioned because it failed to explain the thumb and finger marks that the coroner had found around Rogers's neck. Loss's sons were questioned, but they refused to corroborate their mother's confession and the case was dropped. Was Rogers murdered or did she die following an abortion? The case has never been solved, but it marked the rise of tabloids, which used the death of Mary Rogers to sell newspapers to a growing readership of working-class men and women. Papers such as the New York Herald, the Evening Post, and the Tribune competed with one another as they followed every lead in the case and published coroner's reports and depositions. The city's growing printing and publishing industry used it to give rise to commercial novels, serialized detective stories, and graphic portrayals of Mary Rogers. American poet and short story writer Edgar Allan Poe subsequently wrote The Mystery of Marie Roget, a fictionalized account based on the murder of Mary Rogers. His story appeared in three parts in Snowden's Lady's Companion, in November and December 1842 and in February 1843. In the story, his fictional detective character named C. Auguste Dupin tries to solve the crime. Poe relied heavily on media coverage from the rising penny press as the source of his information about the Rogers murder. The death of the beautiful Seagar Girl marked an early example of how the media seized on a gruesome crime to boost its circulation. If you like stories so far, do not forget to subscribe my channels. Thanks.